Good morning, everyone. <laughs> it is way too early to talk about distributed transactions, but we're going to do this anyway. So my name is Jimmy. Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at jbogard. Um, all the slides and all the code that you'll see today is also on my GitHub at github.com slash jbogard. There's a presentations repository, and that's where I put everything up there. Um, this topic, along with a lot of other things, you can find on my blog at jimmybogard.com, and that's a bunch of other junk about me up there at the bottom there. So, <laughs> distributed transactions. I want to rewind to a simpler time um, when I didn't have to worry about distributed transactions. And in a simpler time, I just had an app and a database. This is probably what most systems that I work with these days is just like the app and a database, and I don't have to do anything else really to deal with uh, any kind of distributed transactions. And so when I have an app and the database, if I want to do something with a database, then it's just a single statement, right? Update, in this case, I'm dealing with orders, so update orders, update the status where I have some ID equals whatever. Everything is good. Now, when I get that information back from the database, hopefully the information I read back out is the exact same thing I just, I just wrote. So if I select the status from orders where ID equals one, two, three, then I should be able to read exactly what I just wrote. And all was good. Um, I was supposed to fill that in with a, with a JPEG, but I couldn't find it in time. Um, so what if I wanted to make things more complicated? What if I wanted to do like, a couple operations here? So I'm not only updating the status, but I'm also updating the inventory because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm approving the order or something like that, so I need to make sure that I subtract the inventory from whatever is there. Now this is okay <clears throat> um, whenever I get the information back as long as everything is inside a transaction. Now, when I have something here where I'm, where I'm starting trying to update the status and I'm decrementing the quantity, if something fails, if I want to make sure that everything happens together, this works as long as I put something inside of an overall transaction. And for the most part, you don't have to worry about this. As long as you're like a normal, like, normal developer that wraps things in transactions, then you can do operations like this and make sure that everything succeeds, or if something fails, then everything goes back to where it was. Now, the first time I ran into distributed transactions, uh, was with a, a slight wrinkle here. Um, it wasn't just a single application in the database, I had two databases. So I had the sales database in which I would update the order status, and I had the shipping database in which I would update the inventory. So I can make that first call to say update the status of the order, uh, where the ID equals whatever, and then I go make a call to the other one that says update the inventory, set the quantity minus the quantity uh, based on whatever the order I saw. And then everything is good, right? No. Because if you try to do this um, just by itself, you'll get some weird cryptic error from SQL. It's like, uh, on the, like, well, you get some error code back, like error code 6743. It's like, you can't do this because these are two different databases and you're trying to do a transaction across these two databases. So what do we do as developers? We go to Stack Overflow. What happened here? Uh, there's something about a, a distributed transaction. Um, because it says, like, it, we're trying to do a transaction across these two databases, and, and we can't do that unless we try to coordinate these two things, and we start to get these, these weird error messages back, and it says we have to use a, a distributed transaction coordinator or the MSDTC. We have to now involve the DBAs and the ops people to open up ports. So it suddenly got much more complicated than we had before. So what is this distributed transaction thing that we have to now worry about? It's just a database transaction in which two or more network hosts are involved. Well, even if they're on the same physical server, if I'm trying to talk to two databases, then I still have to involve this, uh, this distributed transaction. Now, in order to accomplish the distributed transaction, the most common protocol that's used is known as a two-phase commit. And we'll walk through this right now. Okay, so with a two-phase commit, we have to have something that actually coordinates the transaction between these different resources. And the resources could be really anything that supports a transaction and this overall protocol. And the two-phase commit starts out with a coordinator asking each resource, can you perform this action? That's known as the prepare phase. So it says, resource A, can you update the status of this order? Yes or no. Resource B, can you update the quantity of the stock? Yes or no. And each different resource says, can I do this operation? Yes or no. Finally, when the coordinator receives the feedback from each of the different resources, it says, okay, um, now that everyone says yes, then we'll go ahead and say, go ahead and commit the transaction. Everything should be okay. Now, this, this two-phase commit protocol is not bulletproof, so if something fails with the second part of the commit phase here, then actually the first thing still succeeded and the second part failed. 
which is unfortunate, right? Because you, you, you're using, you, you Googled, you went on Stack Overflow, you updated all the settings, you, put, uh, you opened up all the ports to be able to do this transaction that costs resources, and yet it's still not 100% bulletproof. So there are additional protocols on top of this to make it even more bulletproof. So there's a three-phase commit. Uh, they stop actually counting after three. It's like n-phase commit, where it's like, just absolutely make sure that everything can succeed or fail, uh, and then if it doesn't, then have these like, complicated rollback things. <clears throat> so if you want to do this in the real world, you have to know, does the thing that I'm trying to commit to actually support this ability to have this two-phase commit? With SQL Server, it does support this through the Microsoft Distributed Transaction Coordinator. And I'm really sorry if you know what that is, because it sucks to have to deal with. So SQL Server does support this. With this extra service, you have to, uh, you have to turn on and make sure all the ports are open for it to work. <clears throat> but it doesn't work all the time. If you turn on always on for SQL Server, you can't do distributed transactions because it cannot coordinate between these like extra servers that it's also writing to, as well as another server that's going on by the teams, which is also unfortunate because like th that's the most expensive checkbox when you're installing SQL Server is like turn on always on. Oops, now you have to have like the ten thousand dollar extra per month license for SQL Server to do this. But now when you do this, you can't actually have these distributed transactions, which they don't tell you, until you also try to turn that on and you get another weird cryptic error message coming back. So that doesn't work. Or if you're in Azure, if you have two different instances of SQL Server to coordinate a transaction, that doesn't work. Or um, even if you like, physically make the servers yourself inside of Azure, that is, you're, using, you're not using the SQL uh, platform as a service stuff, if you just install SQL Server, the Azure folks will not turn on the ports to allow you to do this because it's so expensive to do in the cloud. You can do this if you're coordinating something like SQL Server and Microsoft Message Queuing. Um, those two things do support a distributed transaction. But if you try to get some other kind of message broker involved, like literally any other message broker, again, these distributed transactions don't work. Or if you're using NoSQL, distributed transactions don't work. Or even transactions with multiple documents on a single database don't work. So just to sum this up, transactions in a single resource, yes, we can do that. Transactions across identical resources, that is two instances of the same thing out there, we cannot do transactions. If I have transactions across disparate resources, that is, I have a database and a queue, we cannot do this. And of course, uh, the last thing that we found out in my, in my client was, we can't even do transactions necessarily across multiple items. So there's, there's the, the, yes, we can do it in some SQL instances, but for NoSQL, we cannot do this. So the, the example that I'll be working on, uh, from is, is working with a document database and a message broker. So the document database in this case uh, was MongoDB. Now MongoDB does have multi-document transactions, but there's a giant disclaimer at the bottom that says, do not use this in production, it's not been fully tested. Which again, it's like not the thing you really wanna see for a database to be like, you can do it, but don't do this in actually in production because it hasn't been fully tested. And then we also were talking to uh, a message broker at the same time. So this, uh, in this case, what we're looking at will be a, a try to do order fulfillment. So this is a e-commerce website in which I'm trying to process an order, in which we're consuming messages from RabbitMQ, we're doing multiple writes to MongoDB, and then we're also producing messages to MongoDB, all within a single transactional activity, that is like a button click or a message handler that says, perform this action, do all these different things, and it should all succeed or it should all fail. Now my client, <clears throat> they just did this like, just like one after the other. Um, but they didn't understand that the databases and the messages they were talking to didn't support the ability to do all this in a single transaction. So at first, it looked something like this. <clears throat> we had uh, the normal sort of uh, CRUD activity where we're getting information out of the database. Um, we would update the uh, order status after we've approved it. And then to, in order to perform the, the actual fulfillment of the order request, we would go through and say for each item in the order request, go ahead and decrement the stock based on what we see. And every time we go through the list, go ahead and update the stock uh, based on each of these things. And then finally, we would tell the clients, um, uh, notify other clients to say, yes, the order's been approved and go on from there. Now there's a problem here, of course, in that none of these activities are involved in any sort of transaction. 
So if any of these operations fails, then this overall ability to approve an order is in some unknown, weird middle state. So I can update the original order request by saying approve it, back and succeed, but as I'm updating the stock, if something fails as I'm looping through those items, then some of the stock has been updated and the sum of the stock has not. And then finally, when I'm notifying downstream systems to say, yes, everything succeeded, go ahead and publish out of this event. If for whatever reason that downstream, um, if that, order, that message broker is down or unavailable, then all the database has been updated, except they haven't notified anyone else that this thing has actually succeeded. <clears throat> so <laughs> looking at all this, you're like, well, just don't use MongoDB. Like, just use a normal database. Um, <laughs> that'd be like the, the normal thing to think. Like, but in this case, uh, they couldn't do that because the, uh, the, the DBAs that manage the database would not, uh, would not allow them to be able to make changes to it, so they said, we'll go MongoDB instead, just like to cut them out of the conversation. Um, and then even if they went to, to go say, let's use SQL instead, um, there's, no, there's no modern message broker that's, that the supports any kind of transactions as part of writing to whatever database it is. So RabbitMQ, uh, ActiveMQ, Azure Service Bus, none of those support the ability to have a coordinated write to a database along with writing this message out to the queues. So basically, they're screwed. Like they, this, will not, this will work on their local machine because everything's up and running, but as soon as they went into any kind of production-like environment and things got under load, then suddenly things start to fail and they're in this, they're in this weird middle state. So you start to Google, can I do distributed transactions with MongoDB and RabbitMQ? And basically the only answer you get is a very highly voted Stack Overflow answer with no accepted answers, and that's like the worst place you wanna be. Like the thing you need the most has no answers whatsoever. But what you do find are some people talking about this, about how you get around the problem of these systems and resources not supporting distributed transactions, and they're usually in the form of some sort of white paper. And so this is what we found is this paper by uh, Pat Helland um, called Life Beyond D Distributed Transactions and Apostate's Opinion. Um, I know what some of those words mean, uh, but distributed transactions was what really I was looking for. How do we get beyond uh, the, the need to have these distributed transactions? Now Pat Helland uh, is a really smart guy. Um, he worked at Microsoft designing the distributed transaction coordinator. So I was like, well he must know what, know what he's doing because he's saying how to move beyond this thing that we're trying to get around. So in this paper, it describes, uh, it describes that if we want to get past this ability to distribu do distributed transactions, then we have to assume that the transactional boundary is just one single item. So one record, one row, one document, whatever that thing is that we can have a transaction around, we have to assume that that's, that is our transactional boundary. And this makes sense because as we move towards a more cloud-based environment, then I can't assume that the thing that I'm writing to is on one single physical server. So if you've ever used something like um, Azure Cosmos DB or MongoDB, you don't necessarily assume that those two different documents are gonna be in the same physical server that you're writing to. So if we make this assumption that the thing I'm writing to is just one single item, then how do I coordinate activities between multiple different things? I still need to approve the order and decrement stock, but how do I do this if I can only write to one thing at a time? And so he describes a solution with this. And the solution is to have some kind of messaging between these different entities. And these entities not only include the business data associated with that item, but they also include communication between that item and another one. And so when I have communication between one item and the other, and I'm also writing that same communication to the same transactional boundary, then this allows us to have some mechanism to be able to coordinate communication between different transactions and different resources. So each different entity will know and remember communication between the other, and as I move out from this, I have multiple entities, multiple uh, transactional boundaries all communicating co with each other, all via messages. And we said, okay, this is great, let's do this. But the problem was, <laughs> it was all, there was no code, it was just pictures and diagrams of how to do this, but no actual implementation behind the scenes. So we actually needed to implement this for our client, but there was no, there was no examples for us to, to be able to do so. <clears throat> so we had to implement that picture ourselves. Now the way we did this was, uh, we had two individual documents, and the documents included some set of business data associated with them. So this is the, like, I'm updating the status, I'm updating the stock information, 
that document was a transactional boundary, we'd have to have that business state as part of it. <clears throat> I wanted to coordinate with another document that also had its own business data, then we needed to have some form of communication between that one document and the other. And we do this via some kind of messaging between each individual document. And each document needed to hold the messages that we'd send from one to the other. So the original document would have some way of notifying other messages, but it had to be inside the same boundary as the transaction. So each document would hold the messages it would send to another individual document. If I wanted to communicate back again from the document to the other, then that document would also need its own individual outbox. And that outbox would include all the messages that I need to send to anyone else. Now, this, is, was, this wasn't enough just to say I can send messages from one document to the other. Whenever I receive messages, I have to remember who has sent me what message because, again, my overall transactional boundary is, is only the document itself. So I need to be able to know, have I received this message before? So each individual document not only included an outbox to tell other people what to do, but also included an inbox that says, this is what I've received from other people. So our overall document, which is the transactional boundary inside of MongoDB, not only included the business data itself, but had to also include messages to communicate to other folks, as well as messages that I've received from other folks. So, let's look at an example of this. <clears throat> All right, so I've got uh, a project here that's using, in this case it's Azure, um, it's Azure Cosmos, Cosmos DB because Microsoft. Um, and in this, in this solution, we've got a user interface that's trying to coordinate a transaction between the um, uh, the order request, that is, I want to update the status, and then any kind of stock information behind the scenes to say, make sure that the stock is decremented based on whatever the order is. <clears throat> so the first thing we have is some way of describing what a message, it, message is. And so what we have to have is something that represents an individual message. Let me bump up the, oh, that's good enough. Now the first thing we need to do is be able to distinguish between one message and the other. So the base thing that every message has to have is some kind of identifier that says, this message is different from that message. As I'm looking at all the messages to process, if I need to know like this message is different from that one, then an ID is the easiest thing for us to go from. <clears throat> the next thing we need is some kind of base class to be able to uh, manage an inbox and an outbox. So in this case, the document base, um, this is what I would actually store inside of MongoDB. Uh, I have to have, of course, the base Mongo junk, which is like ID and e tag, And then I need to have the ability to have uh, a, a set of messages representing the inbox and the outbox. So as part of persisting my document, I don't just have the business data itself, I also need to include the messages that I'm receiving or sending to other documents. Again, because that's my transactional boundary, and so I have to include, as part of my transactional boundary, any communication that I'm sending or receiving, receiving to other folks. <clears throat> so, um, now that I have an ability to uh, persist messages that I'm sending to other people, and persist messages that I'm, I've received from other people, um, the final piece then is to uh, be able to communicate to different messages um, to be able to perform this overall activity. So let's look at the order request to see how that's done. <clears throat> so um, this overall order request is part of processing the button click to be able to save the order. And so as part of processing that order, we have to say we're going to take the items from the cart and persist them into the order request, and that will kick off things behind the scenes to actually process it. But to be able to process it, we need to communicate to other outside parties. So we're doing the normal thing, which is I need to uh, persist my own individual business data, which is the customer information and the items information in the carts. And then I need to notify downstream systems to say, go ahead and process this order. But I can't do that directly. I can't just use a database or use, this, uh, use the message queue to be able to say, go ahead and process this order. I have to communicate via my own outbox to be able to have that message go out. So the last piece then 
is to send a message to other systems to say, go ahead and uh, process this order. This send, though, is not going to actually physically send a message to anyone else downstream. It's only going to add a message to my own individual outbox. In this case, it's order created. And the send is not actually physically sending a message. It's only adding a message to my own individual outbox. And that's it. So just to wrap all this up, we have to update our own business data, because that's what we're supposed to do. And then we have to communicate to other downstream resources, but we can't do so directly. So what we'll do is add a message to our own outbox, which is the only transactional boundary we can, we can actually guarantee. And then something else will then kick off that downstream process to go ahead and, and do more stuff. <clears throat> so something has to actually take that message and process it. And to be able to do so, we have to have something that's looking at the outbox of these overall documents and saying, something needs to be processed. Go ahead and send it down to downstream sy systems. And so this other thing that's going to be doing this will be a dispatcher. The dispatcher will be, if I like, rewind time to like before computers, and I'm, I'm imagining um, like a Mad Men sort of scenario where we have uh, no computers whatsoever and people need to communicate via like, physical documents. Then the dispatcher is that person that's like walking down the aisle, taking messages off people's desks, and then delivering them out to other individual folks. The dispatcher will be the thing that's taking messages out of the outbox and then giving them to other documents in their inbox. So the way this will work is our first uh, operation will be to put messages in our overall outboxes along with any kind of data that we're needing to do. And that is the only transaction that we can actually support, is that one document with its data in its outbox. The dispatcher is looking for messages in outboxes, and it will take the message from the outbox of that one document and send it along to any other documents that are interested in that overall message. As each document processes the message, it adds that, that message to its inbox, and when it's done processing the message, then that transaction completes and says, yes, I've, I've successfully completed, um, and I'm also remembering that I processed this, this message based on that message being in my inbox. All right, so let's look at uh, an example of this. So we'll look at our dispatcher. Patch. Document message dispatcher, yep. <clears throat> so this dispatcher is the thing that's pulling messages off of individual documents and then passing them to new things that will be able to process those messages. Okay, so in this document, uh, in this uh, message dispatcher, it's going to dispatch messages based off of the outbox of a single document. It will loop through all the messages in the outbox of the document and then pass them over to something that will then go handle those messages. Now the dispatcher itself doesn't necessarily know like who or what is going to be dispatching these messages to. And so instead of us directly communicating with those individual documents, what we'll do is have an intermediary. In the case in this, of this, we'll have a, a document message handler. I document message handler? Yes. A document message handler will just handle an individual message. And then for this, if we look at uh, the actual the handler for, uh, in this case, creating an individual order. This is what receives the message from the outbox of an individual document and then finally processes it. So this is whenever I'm creating an order, I need to go uh, start the process of fulfilling it. So in this case, what we'll do is uh, get the, uh, look to see if there's any kind of order fulfillment in process. Um, if, that, if I don't find one, then I'll go ahead and create a new order fulfillment document. And then finally, pass it over to the order fulfillment document itself to be able to handle whatever it is to fulfill an order. And then finally, we'll go ahead and update that individual document. So, with that in place, we're able to take messages out of outboxes, find whoever can process them, and then pass those messages to those individual documents to do whatever it is that they need to be able to process that message, and hopefully everything goes okay. But 
The whole point of this is we don't have transactions, uh, distributed transactions. We can't guarantee that everything succeeds or fails. So we have to design this such that when things go wrong, we can still recover from those failures. So in this original picture, um, we had the first document that had the outbox. We're passing messages to the inbox of another document, and it's supposed to uh, all succeed or fail. But if something goes wrong with our second one, then we need to be able to, ha to uh, know that something failed and be able to retry this operation. So we'll have something that detects the failures and then says, oops, I, you know, something didn't succeed, so we'll be able uh, to, to pass it off to something behind the scenes to say, go ahead and retry this operation sometime in the future. Now this is what the distributed transactions get, uh, do for us for free. They will coordinate the activity between these two different uh, resources, and when something fails, then it'll roll back the entire transaction. But we don't have that anymore, so we have to do this kind of operation ourselves to say, when something fails, then go ahead and take some, uh, some other corrective action. In this case, we'll go ahead and retry that. So in the case of needing to retry something, then that dispatcher will read messages out of some other durable store that is able to uh, persist that something needs to be retried. And it will retry this entire operation that is taking messages out of the original outbox and then passing that message out to everyone that's interested. The first one uh, that receives it has already processed this message. So we need to make sure that it doesn't process this again. So in the case of order fulfillment, we need to make sure that it doesn't decrement the stock twice for that individual item. And how does it do this? It does this by remembering communication with other parties via this inbox. So when it receives this message, it checks to see, have I already done this operation before by looking at its inbox? And if I've already seen this message before, then nothing to do. I've already done this operation. For other documents that have not done this before, they look in their inbox and say, oh, I, I haven't actually processed this before. So let me go ahead and do this operation. And then finally, that will succeed. We can only do this if we remember the communication between other documents and other parties. That inbox is a thing that we use to look at to say, have I processed this message before? And because our transactional boundary is only around the document, that inbox has to be inside of our document itself. So it's not good enough just to have an outbox to communicate to outside parties. Because something can fail in between and we don't know what succeeded or failed, we have to be able to retry an operation and make sure that we don't do the same operation twice. And the easiest way to do so is just to remember communication via the inbox. So now that all handlers have succeeded here, we can go back to the original document that had its outbox and say, OK, now that we've notified and processed all downstream consumers, let's go ahead and remove that message from your outbox so that we don't process this message again. Once that's succeeded, then we've successfully <laughs> processed this overall operation. OK, so let's look at an example of the processing of an individual message. OK, so we stopped here, which was the handler of the order created message. Um, and there was some stuff in here to uh, start the order fulfillment process by creating a new order fulfillment document. There's this piece down here, though, which was passing the message over to the order fulfillment document to actually handle it. Now, because we can't guarantee that this method only execute, ex executes once, our transactional boundary is only one document at a time, and so we can't coordinate between removing the message and processing the message, so that means that we have to make sure that this method could execute multiple times. So we do some stuff in the beginning that says, we'll just make sure the fulfillment only gets created once, but when we pass the message over to the order fulfillment document, we need to make sure that that handle method only executes once. And we do this, inside the document by making sure that when I receive this message, I check to see have I received this message before. So this is the actual business logic behind processing the order cancel message. So it says uh, for each individual order that's created, I need to uh, fill my line items with the line items that were from the order, and then I need to send out 
to the stock folks a uh, stock request to say, I want to go decrement, uh, this is the amount of, of stock requested based on this product ID, and I need, to, I need to request that you go ahead and decrement this individual stuff. Again, I can't coordinate directly with those other documents, so if I want to ask other folks to be able to process this individual request, I have to do so via my outbox. Now the last piece is to make sure that this overall method is only executed once. And so that's done inside of this process method. <clears throat> this process method looks at the me incoming message and says, do I contain that document message? Have I seen this message before? If I've seen this mes message before, then I don't have anything to do, and then I'll go ahead and say, yep, I've, I've done what you asked me to do, nothing else to do. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and process this action, whatever you asked me to do, and then finally add that message to my inbox. So when this method completes, I will have performed whatever business action that you asked me to do, and I will process and store the message in my inbox. So if this thing has to execute another time, then I won't have to do the action again. I'll just look to see, yep, you contain that document message, nothing to do. <clears throat> so the next piece is, <laughs> something has to call dispatch for an individual document. I've just, I just instantiated a document, uh, put some messages in an outbox, and then something's handling them, but something needs to initiate taking the messages out of the outbox and then processing them with other things. <clears throat> so in our case, we had to look at uh, what are all the things we could possibly do as part of an overall button click. And over that, in that overall button click, we wanted to make sure that we could process as much as we could. So there was the first document that was the real business work, but then we wanted to make sure that we could try to process other things as well. So for that, we had a unit of work that could take messages out of the outbox of a document, find everything that's been done, and then look at anything else that what needed to have work done, and then process those messages as well. So as work was being done by individual documents, each document would register itself in a unit of work so that if I needed to process any of those documents' messages, there was something that kept track of all the things that have happened and then all the documents I needed to process. So as each document processed, uh, it would register itself with a unit of work, unit of work to say, okay, now that I've processed this one document, let's go ahead and uh, do any kind of downstream work with the, any other document that I might have, and then keep going and keep going until uh, there's nothing left. Sometimes documents would fail, and so I'd have to flag them, and then those would be the pieces that would then kick it off to some kind of retry policy to say, something failed, go ahead and try this operation again. <clears throat> now, in the case of a failure, I don't know exactly what failed and where, and so the unit of work would say, let's go ahead and start from the top and work our way down until we are able to succeed the entire uh, set of documents based on this overall unit of work. All right, so let's look at an example of our unit of work. So the unit of work is the thing that needs to call the document dispatcher. Something has to call dispatch on an individual document, and so something has to keep track of all the things that have happened in order to, be know, in order to know who I need to dispatch these individual messages for. So, that is our unit of work. <clears throat> now, if you're just coming from like entity framework land, uh, you don't have to worry about these kinds of patterns. Something's already keeping track of which records have been updated and changed in order to flush them out and save those changes to the database. In MongoDB land or uh, Azure, Azure Cosmos DB land, there's nothing that keeps track of which documents have changed in order to be able to save those to the database. Every time you call save, it will, like, it will make that call immediately to go save that document. And so we don't want to do that. We want to have something that keeps track of which documents I've changed so that I can then dispatch any kind of outbox messages to whatever documents I need those messages dispatched to. And so that will be our unit of work. Our unit of work um, will be able to uh, get messages uh, out or get documents out of the underlying um, document repository. Uh, I can register individual documents or a group of documents. And then finally, I can complete the unit of work or because there's no transactions, I can't roll back because 
we don't have transactions. Uh, so I can reset it though to say um, we've, we, uh, we, need to re we need to retry this entire operation. So go ahead and reset the overall unit of work. All right. <clears throat> So behind the scenes, this is just a bunch of uh, like communication with the underlying client APIs for this. So uh, to find um, a document, um, oh yes, the identity map. So <clears throat> we need to make sure that I don't accidentally process the messages twice for an individual document because that's wasteful. Um, so what we'll do is we'll store all of the documents uh, that we're processing for an individual request in what's known as an identity map. An identity map is um, a, kind of a cache for pulling things out of the underlying data store. And this cache is really just a hash or set. It says, um, I, need to, I need to collect the documents that I've uh, processed and just make sure I only have one instance in memory for each document that I'm going to be processing for this overall request. So um, whenever I find uh, a document, um, I'm going to be looking at my identity map first. If I don't find it there, then it's going to go to the underlying client uh, data store to be able to pull those documents out. To complete the transaction or complete the uh, overall request, what we'll be doing is looping through all the documents that I've stored in this overall request, and then any document that has anything in its outbox, right here, I will then go call the dispatcher to say dispatch that document to that, uh, dispatch the messages from that outbox of that document to anyone that's interested in what's going on there. Now if something goes wrong, then we'll go ahead and skip that for the next one and then add it uh, to an outbox or to a uh, to retry queue to say go ahead and dispatch uh, this individual document that failed offline. So this kind of assumes that I can have partial success and partial failure. This is where we need to have a conversation with the business to say, is it okay if I process some of these documents uh, successfully and some of them uh, may fail off and they can succeed them offline? Or if there's some other business logic that says we have to have this all succeed or all fail, then I'd have to have some business logic that says uh, go, go ahead and undo the actions of whatever happened before. That's a conversation I would have to have with the business. In the case of e-commerce, I want to succeed as much as I can because I can replenish stock. I can just go order more stuff. Uh, but for some cases, I may need to have uh, uh, some kind of undo operation. And so that's just something I have to, have to talk with the business to understand what's most appropriate for this, uh, for this scenario. <clears throat> so uh, the last thing I wanted to show was the repository that pulls uh, these different pieces off. I die. <laughs> now, normally I don't like the repository pattern because it, for, for most of the like, database-based ORMs that I work with, that pattern already exists. But for something like uh, Azure Cosmos DB or MongoDB, they don't have a concept of a repository, so I'm going to be creating one of those things myself. So this document repository, um, this is the normal API that I'd go through. And so instead of my, my client code directly reaching into the Cosmos DB or MongoDB API, I need to have something that wraps all that in, uh, in order to be able to process these outbox messages. And so I introduce a repository because it didn't exist before. So this repository is the thing I'll be talking to in my normal business logic code, and then this will encapsulate all the stuff behind the scenes to be able to get stuff out of my uh, unit of work um, or to fall back and then call the client API. So um, if I want to actually get an item out of the database, yes. This is the piece that will find an item by, by ID. It will first look at the unit of work to see, uh, do I have this overall uh, item? And if I have it, then go ahead and return that. Otherwise, I will use the underlying uh, API for whatever document database I'm working with, uh, get that item out of the database, and then register that item with the unit of work so that the unit of work can track it appropriately, and then finally go ahead and return it back out. And this is all the other like weird document DB code I have to write for Cosmos, like status code junk. <clears throat> so when I'm using this, uh, my client code, this will be all the way, yeah. 
my client code will just use the repository itself, and the repository will handle the, the work of getting things in and out of the unit of work, um, being able to register those things, and make sure that behind the scenes, the unit of work is able to then process those messages in the overall outbox. My client code, though, just knows repository. Okay. So that's when things go wrong. Um, I, re I register them in the unit of the work, and then I can go ahead and retry them if something goes wrong. But what if, what if something like, really goes wrong? So in this case we had before, uh, we communicated to a set of documents, and those documents succeeded, and then one of them failed. And so it's, we should be able to recover from this failure as long as the unit of work then says, oh, something failed, go ahead and write that out to uh, a retry queue. But what if the unit of work itself fails? Because again, our transactional boundary is each individual document. Something could fail in that document, but then, again, someone pulls the plug in the overall uh, system, and a unit of work is not able to then go push that off to something behind the scenes. So we have to have some sort of fallback. And our fallback is gonna be something that's listening for changes in documents, and having a backup uh, communication to say, uh, if, if this overall operation succeeds or fails, then we'll have something behind the scenes that can go ahead and take those individual documents and then go ahead and process them behind the scenes uh, via retries. So, let's look at an example of a trigger to be able to handle these uh, offline messages. Now, this, does, this is very specific to uh, Azure Cosmos DB. Um, Azure Cosmos DB has the ability to have triggers or, cha uh, or change uh, notifications so that every time a document changes, you can have some set of code that's executed based on whatever change that occurs. And so we'd be hooking into that to say, anytime someone changes a document that has an outbox with messages to process, um, notify us so that we can process those messages offline. So this will be document feed observer. <clears throat> so this uh, document feed observer will execute each time a document changes. And every time a document changes, we want to look to see if that, met, that document has anything in its outbox. So it'll do something very similar to the, uh, to the overall dispatcher, uh, or the unit of work, that says, you know, as I process individual changes for these documents, if I have any items in my outbox, then go ahead and, and uh, notify a retry queue to go ahead and process those individual documents. So this will uh, not process those messages immediately. It will put a message on a durable store, in this case Azure Service Bus, to say go ahead and process uh, the document messages for this individual item. So the handler for this will just call the dispatcher. So it's taking messages off of a queue to say go ahead and process the messages for this individual document, and eventually that, that goes ahead and calls the same uh, dispatcher we had before. It will look to see if there's any messages in the outbox, and then for each message in the outbox, uh, dispatch those messages to each individual document. Now this will execute for every single document that we have uh, changes for. Uh, so we have, to, we have to decide, do we want, um, as part of executing the overall operation, do we want to have the messages all processed immediately for each document, or do we want to just, just completely rely on back-end processing to be able to coordinate uh, uh, communication between overall documents? <clears throat> so for us, uh, in the real-world example for our clients, we did a mix, so we said when the, when the user clicks the button, We'll try to process everything in the context of that button click, and then just the back-end uh, back notifications will just be a fallback. So if something failed based on the button click, then this will go ahead and process those messages for us behind the scenes. We could have done it, though, where it says, I will only do the primary document. It says, when I ever click the button, um, I will only do the one single operation for that one single document, and this will be the thing that does all of the back-end uh, coordination between my different documents, and then I won't have any other operations that, that try to occur as part of the button click. So, the overall unit of work, uh, unit of work, 
we have this part that says complete. It says after I've processed some operation for the user, look at all the documents that I've worked with and go ahead and try to dispatch those opbox messages to anything that perhaps could, uh, could handle those things. So this does need to execute at some point during the request. And so for us, we wind up doing this as part of uh, every time I do something in the, uh, every time I process some kind of operation, then something's going to wrap that operation and complete the unit of work. So depending on the uh, context of whatever you're executing in, in our case, we were in a mixed environment of web requests and backend services. Uh, so we had to have something that just wrapped any kind of operation to complete the unit of work. But if you're, using something, if you're just using pure web requests or ASP.NET Core, then you'd probably do the uh, unit of work inside something like a, a filter to say, uh, start the request, uh, perform the operations, and then at the end of the request, go ahead and complete the unit of work. <clears throat> in our case, we had a mixed environment, so we had to have something that could potentially execute anywhere. So uh, we wrote something that could execute despite any kind of a context that we'd be working in. So um, our developers didn't have to worry about making sure they called complete the unit of work because, again, if I have to remember to do something, I'll probably forget. Uh, so this uh, unit of work behavior executes for every single request that we uh, have in our, our system. And uh, if something happens to change with an outbox or with a document with an outbox, then this will always make sure that I complete the unit of work and dispatch those messages to any other potential document that's there. All right. So the last thing we'll be looking at is a more, uh -oh, a more complex example. <clears throat> so in our first uh, set of code, we were just uh, completing an order. Someone clicked the button and they have to notify downstream system systems. It wasn't doing anything interesting. When I'm fulfilling the order, then I have to start looking at coordinating between the individual order request itself and looking at any kind of downstream stock information to make sure that based on what the person is trying to order, do I have enough stock available to complete that? Now each individual stock item is another individual document with its own individual stock. So I have to ask each stock item to say, do I have enough stock to complete this request? And you tell me, based on that stock information, can I, uh, can I complete this overall order? And only if, when all the different stock items tell me we have enough stock to complete this order, then the overall order request is okay and we can fulfill that, uh, fulfill that order. So we have to introduce this middle piece, uh, this, uh, this saga, which is a, it's a, a, a coordinator between the order request itself, someone trying to order something, and the overall stock items. And it's gonna be communicating with each individual item, again, via these outbox messages. It's going to ask the order request. Uh, well, the order request itself will tell the order fulfillment saga, yes, the order's been created, and these are the items that I want to order. The order fulfillment saga is then going to communicate out to the individual stock items to say, uh, I want to request this amount of stock based on my order. And the stock items will look at it, their overall uh, inventory and say, yes, I have enough stock or not, and tell the order fulfillment saga, yep, we've got the stock and I've, I've confirmed it and we've decremented it from our inventory so everything's good to go. Now something can go wrong here. So between the time the, uh, as, I, I'm, as, as I'm going through each individual stock item, if one of the stock items doesn't have enough inventory for, to fulfill it, then I need to unwind the entire operation. So I have to go back and say, oops, uh, the stock request is, was denied based on whatever I, stock information I've seen. Uh, so based on that, I have to then go tell the other previous stock items the order has been canceled because I don't have enough stock in this one overall item, and so restore the overall inventory uh, because I'm gonna roll this entire order back. Then finally, we go communicate back to the original order request to say our order was rejected because we didn't have enough stock based on this one individual item. By the way, I hope at the end of this you're like, let's just do SQL. <laughs> this all assumes that we're not. But you know, in a, like a normal database, we just wrap this whole thing in a transaction and we're good to go. But because we're using things that don't allow us to have transactions between these individual items, then I have to have this very set of deliberate communication between these individual documents to be able to handle the situation where something could partially succeed and partially fail. So 
Let's look at the example. This is the full, complete example of trying to fulfill an order request. Okay, so we started out first with the uh, order, uh, order request being created. We create that order request based on the shopping cart information that the person has done for via the button click. Uh, so we're, we're just persisting the, the normal, oh no. We're persisting just the normal customer information and the items, uh, setting its status to new, and then I have to notify the downstream systems to start processing this order. Again, okay, we can't do that directly because we're not in a normal SQL database, and so I'm, I'm creating a message in my own individual outbox to say, an order has been created, and then this is the information that's pertinent to those downstream systems. My order ID, the line items, and then the product ID and quantity for each of those individual line items. As part of doing this operation, I'm registering myself with the unit of work, and at the end of the unit of work, when it completes, it's looking for anything messages in the outbox, and then taking those messages and dispatching them to any other potential folks. So the person that's going to be uh, interested in this message, order created handler, yes. I'm receiving, the, I'm receiving the notification that the order's been created, and so I have to start an order fulfillment process to be able to take the order information and then ask each of the stock items, do you have enough stock to be able to process this order and decrement the stock based on whatever I find in this order request? But again, I can't do that directly, so we have to go through another message, which is in my order fulfillment uh, process itself, this individual document that says, uh, for each item, there we go, uh, for each individual line items, I'm going to send a stock request based on the product ID and the amount I'm requesting. So now that the order fulfillment has uh, persisted all of its stock requests, then each individual stock item has to receive this stock request and check to see do I have enough stock uh, to be able to process this individual order. So, if I go look at stock request, yep. <clears throat> now when it's handling each stock request, again, I have to wrap this all in a process so that if I have received this message before, I check to see if it's in my inbox, and if it's in my inbox, then I don't process it, so I don't decrement stock twice ac accidentally. But in the, in the actual business logic, I will check to see, um, is the quantity available that I have greater than or equal to the amount that's been requested, then we're good. I have enough stock, we can go ahead and uh, decrement my stock. So I will decrement the quantity available uh, based on the amount requested and send a message back to say, yep, I've, I've got enough stock, I've decremented the stock available, and I have confirmed your stock request. So we send a message back to, again, whoever's interested, I've received your stock request, I've confirmed your stock request, and decremented the stock available based on whatever you've ordered. If I don't have enough stock, then I will send the stock request denied. Oh, that's way too small. There we go. If I don't have enough stock, then I tell them, oops, I, I can't do this, uh, and so this is the product and order fulfillment that I can't, uh, that I can't fulfill the stock, it's been denied. This message gets persisted to the outbox. The unit of work keeps track of this. The dispatcher takes the message from the outbox, and again, then I have to go tell the order fulfillment saga that I don't have enough stock, or I do have enough stock, and to continue processing. So back in my order fulfillment operation, uh, after the order's been created, I have to handle uh, confirmation or denying. So confirmation is just looking at my line items and say, yep, I have confirmed from the stock. Uh, and then check to see if it's all good. If the stock request has been denied, then I need to cancel the overall order, uh, which is unwinding all the individual operations. So each time I receive a confirmation for stock, I have to check to see, have all the stock items been confirmed? And if all the stock items have been confirmed, then I send out a message saying, yep, order fulfillment is successful, 
and then I can tell the customer, yep, we've successfully processed your order. If I have to cancel the order, that is, I don't have enough stock available for me, then I have to, for every single line item, I have to return the stock and then re-up the stock based on the order being canceled. <laughs> yes, it's a lot of work to do all this. <laughs> but because my transactional boundary is only one single document at a time, I have to have this very deliberate incremental communication of notifications between each individual party. So in my head, the way I design this, as I imagine each document as a person that has to talk to someone else to be able to perform this overall business activity. And so every time I have to talk to someone to tell them, like, let them know or uh, communicate, then that tells me the communication I need inside my individual document. <clears throat> so, yes, it's a, it's a lot of work to put all this in place. This is the only way I can make sure that I can coordinate these activities between uh, different documents or different resources that cannot support this overall transaction. So, there are some other places that we could see this crop up. Um, so if I try to coordinate a transaction between something that does support distributed transactions, like SQL Server, and something that does not, like RabbitMQ, then we have to worry about, well, what happens when something fails between these two things? So if you're in a situation where you're writing to something that does support multi-document transactions, like SQL Server, uh, but then you start to involve something else that does not, you have to think about, well, what happens when that other operation fails? So the overall approach that we take is to find whatever transactional boundaries that exist in every single resource uh, based on whatever we find, and then include uh, that outbox based on whatever that transactional boundary we, we find is. So MongoDB, for example, um, it doesn't have individual, it doesn't have transactions uh, for each individual document. Instead, um, so it doesn't have transactions around a group of documents. Instead, it has transactions around each individual document. Uh, SQL Server, though, of course, supports transactions across multiple records, so that's our transactional boundary there. So as part of that, we can just include the outbox uh, for whatever transactional boundary we find. So for something like Azure Cosmos DB or MongoDB, our outbox will be scoped to those transactional boundaries of the document. But something like SQL Server, they can have the transaction around the entire database, then our outbox can then encompass just a single table uh, that it gets written to along with all those other documents itself. <clears throat> other places we see this is in microservices, where I have to coordinate activities between overall services. So I have one service, uh, microservice A, uh, that has its own database with an outbox, and as I'm doing things, I will take the messages from this outbox and then dispatch them to some other microservice on the other side. So it's taking those messages from the outbox, uh, going through some sort of translation to the outside world, and then passing them along to a broker, which then takes those messages off the queue, and then passes them over to a receiver, to a dispatcher, and then finally to the other inbox of the other side. Again, because we don't want to have transactions across microservices, that's crazy talk. Um, this is how we can facilitate communication between overall uh, service boundaries without trying to involve a transaction that uh, we don't know if that can actually uh, succeed or fail. So, <clears throat> overall, our lessons here. Um, distributed transactions are easy when I'm local. That is, if everything's on the same box and I'm not crossing network boundaries, then it's possible and it's actually very uh, reasonable to do. Um, when, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm actually distributed, that is, when things are on different machines or different networks, then distributed transactions uh, are hard or impossible which is ironic because it's got distributed in the title, but you can't act, usually you can't actually do them when your resources are distributed. So in order to facilitate these coordinated activities between individual resources, we have to find the transactional boundaries that are appropriate based on whatever resource, and then introduce outboxes to coordinate communication between all those different resources. So going from that original paper, uh, an apostate's opinion, uh, this was our implementation of uh, life beyond distributed transactions uh, with the outbox and inbox to coordinate those communications. So if you want a, a full working running example, you can find this on my GitHub. Uh, there's a presentations repository that you can find all the code behind the scenes here with Cosmos DB, uh, Azure SQL, and uh, Azure Service Bus. 
Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> or if you take away from this, just use SQL. That, that's also valid. <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs>